just a quick introduction uh, to our team. Um, my name is Tim Jarvis. I'm the community health manager here at Johnson County Public Health. Uh, Jamie and Haley are our two public health systems analysts. Giselle is our health planner. Uh, Lisa is our chronic disease prevention specialist. And RSA is our CDC public health associate. Uh, and together, um, this is our five person team for our health assessment uh, and community improvement planning process for Johnson County. Uh, today, we're going to cover um, our methods of how we collected information uh, and data within Johnson County. Um, staff will go over uh, their portions, but we'll cover demographics uh, and the um, representation uh, of our assessment and our surveying, uh, health status. Uh, we will talk about healthcare access, uh, food security, and then at the end, we'll cover uh, any questions or answers that folks may have about anything specifically they saw in here or other um, questions folks might have on um, how we collected the data or the total process overall. Uh, but real quick, uh, what we refer to as Healthy Joko is uh, our community health assessment and improvement planning process, uh, our effort here in Johnson County. Um, as folks uh, may not be aware of, um, county health departments across the state and nation are obligated to uh, assess their community and then identify priorities uh, to ultimately work with community partners, community members across sectors uh, of the entire community to really prioritize um, the, the largest health needs that they have, utilize the existing resources um, available, and then to brainstorm and look at other innovative ways to um, improve the health status of the community. Um, our process, our Healthy Joko, follows the National Association for County and City Health Officials uh, framework. Uh, we'll refer to it, and you'll hear us say MAP a lot. Uh, but MAP, uh, or M-A-P-P, -P, uh, stands for Mobilizing for Action Through Planning and Partnerships. And we are using uh, one of the most updated frameworks that NACHO has provided for us. Uh, and so we're excited to be able to uh, jump into this process, uh, to be able to re-engage our community um, for these efforts, uh, especially now post-pandemic, uh, where we know that there's a lot of work to be done. Um, in 2022, uh, our community status assessment uh, really aim to describe the community in a quantitative way uh, by measuring demographics, health status, and other social determinants of health uh, so that we could look at and identify other existing inequities uh, at probably the most granular level that we could do uh, for our community. So uh, having said all that, I will pass it off uh, to Jamie uh, to uh, describe our methods. Thank you, Sam. Yes, as Sam mentioned, I'm um, Jamie, I'm our public health systems analyst, one of one of two, um, but I'll just kind of lead you through the methods of the survey itself and how we kind of put it together. Um, so we expanded our questions from the behavioral risk factor surveillance system survey that the state does um, every year. And so we requested data from the state and really took a good look at our information that we received um, and any areas of interest that we really needed to expand upon. Um, we really wanted to look into questions of why. Um, so if we saw something interesting in the data and we didn't have any explanations of, of exactly why or what the barriers were, um, we wanted to ask those questions in this assessment. Another area um, where we kind of expanded questions from was community partner input. So in early spring of 2022, we asked some partners, what are some questions you have um, in the community? And so we in included a few of those in this assessment. Um, we also ex included a few questions from this um, personal experiences of US racial ethnic minorities in today's difficult times um, conducted by Robert Wood Johnson Foundation in the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Medicine and NPR. Um, the survey was available online and we distributed uh, in a variety of ways. So we distributed through um, tablets on site, um, posters with QR codes, websites, um, our social media, including like Reddit pages, <laughs> um, emails to partners, so for, through word of mouth, um, just a variety of different ways. And one thing that was really interesting too is we um, partnered up with four different sites in the community that helped us distribute the survey with tablets. Um, so we actually help, had help with the University of Iowa College Public Health Strike Force team and students um, staffed up these 
partner site locations with tablets um, and just asked people that came through the door if they'd be able to take the survey. So um, overall, we had it open from September 22nd um, to November 19th. So just a little, just about a month or just two months there. Um, so we collected a pretty good amount of data there. Um, and then we, let's see, the data we collected immediately went into a dashboard that we have through Qualtrics. Um, the analysis was done also through Qualtrics. As mentioned earlier, with partner sites helping collect data, we were able to give those partner sites actually access to the data that they collected through the dashboard. So they got de-identified client data, and then we got that population health data. Um, so in talking with partners prior to the assessment, we recognize there's a low capacity for many nonprofits and other partner sites to really collect um, client-specific data. And so we were able to kind of help alleviate this a little bit and give them some insights into like who their clients are and how um, the health of their clients are doing. So um, let's see, all survey responses with less than 18% of reported progress were excluded because that just accounted for um, folks getting through the demographic questions. So none of the other health specific questions were um, answered at that time. So we excluded those. Um, and in total then 726 respondents completed the assessment. Um, so for Johnson County, that's about a rate of at a 95% confidence interval, that's about a 4% margin of error. Uh, we do see some questions where that overall response um, is a little bit lower. So that margin of error would, would increase a little bit. Um, but overall, we feel like this is pretty representative of the population. Um, we tried to just aggregate data as much as we could by many different demographic factors like race, ethnicity, education, sex, gender, um, age, socioeconomic status, whether they rent a home versus housing, and you'll see all of that later on in the assessment um, or in this presentation. Um, counts less than six with that demographic data were, um, were not shown just for anonymity. Um, but we are, I will mention, we're happy to accommodate data requests for um, certain disaggregated values if it's not shown in the full report too. So if folks have a, a need for writing a grant or something like that, um, we're happy to take data requests too. And I will hand it off to Lisa now to discuss demographics collected. Thanks, Jamie. Um, yeah, I will get us started off with an overview of the demographic characteristics of our survey respondents. So as Jamie said, we had 726 total responses um, from people who live or work in Johnson County, and 682 of those respondents provided their zip code. So you can see the distribution of responses from each zip code in the map on the right. Um, with counts lower than six just omitted for privacy. Um, and the majority of the responses were around Iowa City, Coralville, and North Liberty. The racial and ethnic representation in our community status sample was similar, but not quite exactly the same proportions as the Johnson County population overall. We also included two categories um, for race that the census did not. We included Middle Eastern or North African, which made up 1.5% of our responses. And we had an other category, which um, we found was mostly selected by respondents who also reported their ethnicity as Hispanic or Latino, Latina, or Latinx. We did have significantly more female than male respondents, and our survey sample was also older than average for the total Johnson County population. Um, we also had similar education levels in our respondents, and uh, we did have a slightly higher percentage of folks with less than a high school diploma, but also more respondents who had at least four years of post-secondary education. So a little bit more on either end of that spectrum um, and the median income of our respondents was also similar to the county overall. Next slide, please. So in the previous slide, we showed responses for biological sex, but this pie chart shows respondents self-reported gender, which was important to capture because we had 29 respondents who identified as either non-binary, transgender, or gender non-conforming. 
And although most of our respondents said that they were heterosexual, um, proportions of non-heterosexual and particularly bisexual respondents um, increased in our younger survey respondents. So to start getting a little bit into socioeconomic status, about 61% of our survey sample reported being employed in some capacity, whether that was employed for wages or self-employed, followed by 22% being retired, 8% being students, and 9% not currently working due to either choosing to stay at home, being unable to work, or being unable to find a job. And most of our respondents had at least a high school diploma with the vast majority having attended at least some college or technical school. But household income, um, despite averaging out to between 60 to $75,000 per year, shows that most people weren't actually in that category. About one third of our survey respondents reported household incomes below 30,000 per year, while the top third of respondents made um, 100,000 per year or more. So that middle one third of respondents makes up anywhere from 30,000 to $100,000 per year for household income, which is quite a range. And you can also see the different variations of this trend in different zip codes. For example, um, 52245 represents um, a small portion of Northeast kind of central Iowa City, uh, and that appears to be comparatively um, well off higher incomes, whereas 52240, which is this larger area of southern and eastern Iowa City, showed a higher proportion of respondents toward the lower end of the income range. But it's important to note that this overall trend of fewer folks in that middle median 60 to 70,000 range, um, whereas a lot more folks were on both the higher and lower ends of that spectrum. And even right away in the demographics, we can see some racial and ethnic disparities in education and household incomes. Um, respondents who were white or Asian were most likely to have four or more years of post-secondary education, while respondents who were Black or African American or Hispanic or Latino, Latina or Latinx were least likely. For household income, Black or African American and Hispanic or Latino, Latina or Latinx respondents tended to have lower household incomes on average compared to white respondents in our survey. So next, I will pass it off to Giselle to talk about health status. Thanks, Lisa. I'll be reviewing our health status portion that includes our main findings for alcohol use, medication use, our chronic health conditions, physical activity, and sleep. Starting off with our self-reported health status, we had 692 survey respondents rate their health from excellent, very good, good, fair, and poor. Um, from our pie chart here, we see that just over 36% um, rated their overall health status as good, followed by very good and fair as our next two most selected responses. When breaking down our self-reported health status by race and ethnicity, we notice that a majority of our Black or African American, Asian, and Hispanic or Latino, Latina, Latinx identifying individuals mark their overall health as good, whereas a majority of our white identifying individuals rank their overall health as very good. Taking a deeper dive into this data and including additional variables such as education or income, we found that those with lower income and less education had a worse overall opinion of their health. In addition to asking community members how they rated their overall health, we separately asked them in the last 30 days, how many of those days were their, was their physical health not good and how many of those days was their mental health not good? On our slides in the top portion is indicating the percentages of our 658 respondents that experienced greater than 14 days of poor physical health, poor mental health, and days where their poor physical or mental health kept them from doing usual activities. Those activities range from self-care, work, recreation, or more. Our bottom portion shows that our averages for each of these categories 
of each of these categories, um, where we see we're averaging five poor physical health days, six and a half poor mental health days, and four days of preventing activities. When comparing our data to the 2019 county health rankings and roadmap findings for quality of life within Johnson County, that highlights our state and national averages, our findings, our averages show are higher. Folks had an option to include written, oh, if you could go back, Sam, sorry. Folks had an option to include written responses for their poor physical or mental health days that included a variety of reasonings. While not everyone left a reason, a few of our repeated answers included mental disorders such as anxiety, depression, or PTSD, as well as stress indicators, uh, whether that was from work, family, illness, school, or financially. Next slide, please. Thanks. As the most commonly used substance, alcohol continues to be a concern in Iowa and across the nation. Uh, a drink may look different depending on the type of alcohol consumed in general. A drink is defined as 12 ounces of beer, five ounces of wine, or one and a half ounces of a shot of liquor. Keeping that in mind, I've included the definition of heavy and binge drinking on the screen. When asking our respondents how many days per week did they had at least one drink of, of an alcoholic beverages, the highlighted portion in our table indicates for both male and female assigned at birth, 262 selected zero to one days per week. Looking further into our alcohol consumption days per week by age, in figure to the left, we see 18 to 24 year olds select that of those days they chose to drink, they typically had three to four drinks, whereas other, rage, other age ranges are consuming one to two drinks. This information is also interpreted by averages or mean on the table to the right, where we see the same age range, 18 to 24, averaging 5.25 drinks. Following alcohol consumption, we had our respondents we asked our respondents if a doctor, a nurse, or another healthcare professional has ever told them they had any of the following. From this, we see that our survey population listed anxiety, high blood pressure, and depressive disorder as our three most commonly selected diagnoses. Keeping that in mind, we also asked our survey population if they are currently taking any prescription medications on a daily basis, where we learned that 665 respondents, um, of those 665, 45% are taking a medication from the conditions reported on the previous slide, 23 are taking a daily medication for something else, and 30% don't take any medication daily. In the top right, we break down respondents for having to delay or go without medication due to costs, where we see 81% 81% list that they do not, 18% indicate that they do go with a delay. In correspondence to chronic health conditions, we calculated average body mass index by age. According to the CDC, the body mass index or BMI screens for weight categories that may lead to health problems. A healthy BMI falls within 18.5 to 24.9. From our table, we see a few age groups fall within those markers, but a large majority of our average population is considered to fall within overweight range 25 to 29.9 and obese range 30 and above. Regardless of those ranges, I want to highlight the average physical activity minutes of those same age groups. The physical activity guidelines for Americans states that each week adults need 150 minutes of moderate to intense physical activity. While most people don't get the recommended amount of physical activity, it can be especially hard for adults and people with chronic disease or disabilities. Stemming for our, from our survey population, all age, all age groups were averaging more than 150 minutes per week with over 70% reporting participated in any physical activity within the last 30 days. Finally, and equally as important in helping maintain our overall health, we have reported sleep, hours of sleep within 24 hour period, where 216 of our respondents reported sleeping seven hours and 183 reported sleeping eight hours. 
the American Academy of Sleep Medicine and the Sleep Research Society included on our CDC's website recommends that adults between 18 to 60 should be sleeping seven hours or more per night. Lastly, when asking our respondents to select what areas may affect their sleep the most, we had stress, trouble sleeping, and trouble staying asleep, um, and trouble falling asleep, sorry, as our top three reasonings. Thanks everyone, I'll pass it on to Haley. Alrighty, in this section, we'll be going over some important topics that fall under the umbrella of healthcare access, including healthcare coverage, having a primary care provider, PCP, uh, physical or routine and dental checkups, healthcare cost barriers, and recommended screenings and prevention services. 559. Of, of the respondents answered yes to having any kind of health care coverage. Of those that answered yes, 145 selected Medicare as their provider and 84 selected Medicaid as shown in the pie graphs below. The tables shown on the right display the data disaggregated farther by race and ethnicity. From these tables, we can see a notable gap in health insurance in the Hispanic, Latina, Latino, Latinx community, as well as a small but still significant gap of health insurance within Johnson County's Black or African American community. Having a primary care provider, or PCP, can keep you healthier, lower your medical costs, and improve your quality of life. Having access to a PCP can help you stay on top of screenings for major health-related conditions and manage chronic conditions, if you have any. According to the Community Status Assessment and displayed in this table, 64% of respondents have at least one person they consider a PCP, 13% have more than one, and 23% indicated that they do not have one. Table HC4 is again disaggregated by race and ethnicity. And again, we see a disparity in this data with 58.33% of respondents who are Hispanic, Latino, Latina, Latinx, reporting that they do not have a PCP and 41.67% of respondents who are part of Johnson County's Black or African-American population reporting that they do not have a PCP, especially when compared to the 13.9% of white, respond white respondents who reported not having a PCP. Receiving routine checkups and dental checkups can allow healthcare providers to catch different illnesses, health, abnorm health abnormalities or cavities before they become more worrisome or expensive. Figure HC6 shows that 81.68% of individuals completed their annual routine checkup within the last month. Figure HC7 shows the percentages of six, 618 survey respondents that answered when they were last seen by a dentist. In figure HC8 showed the top three reasons for not seeing a dentist being one, not having dental insurance, two, concerns that the cost of a visit would be too expensive, and three, not having any noticeable issues with their teeth. Which brings us to our next topic of the cost barriers associated with healthcare access. This slide shows that 15.78% of the respondents did not see a doctor due to the cost in the last 12 months. And of these respondents, 11.75% or 73 respondents report not having health insurance. Of these 73 respondents without health insurance, 41 report not seeing a doctor due to cost. The table below details the outcome of not seeing a doctor or healthcare provider due to cost in the past 12 months. 23.53% reported that their condition worsened and 5.88% waited and ended up going to the emergency room. The next few slides will go into an important part of preventative health care, screenings. On this slide, we see that the pink tables display the percentage of the 558 respondents answering if they have received a colorectal cancer screening. Figure HC12 shows that the count for the 250 survey respondents answering when they had this screening completed. Figure HC8 excludes the prefers not to answer or not sure responses. This slide shows us data collected on breast cancer screenings, as well as having low cholesterol levels checked. The orange pie chart displays the percentage of the 301 survey respondents answering if they had received a breast cancer screening. And the chart to the left of that displays the count for the 273 survey respondents answering when they had the screening completed. This chart excludes prefer not to answer and not sure responses. The blue pie chart displays the percentage of 
the 593 survey respondents answering if they had had their cholesterol levels checked. And the chart to the left of it displays the count of the 457 survey respondents answering when they had this exam completed. Figure HC18 excludes preferers not to answer and not sure responses. And lastly, we look, we look at this slide where we look over what blood sugar screen blood sugar testing for diabetes and HIV testing looks like in Johnson County. The purple pie chart displays the percentage of, of the 305 survey respondents answering if they had received a blood sugar test. And the chart next to it displays the count for the 191 survey respondents answering when they had this test completed. This figure excludes prefers not to answer and not sure responses. The yellow pie chart on the left displays the percentage of the 571 survey respondents answering if they had been tested for HIV. The pie chart to the right of that displays the count for 457 survey respondents answering when they had this ex exam completed and shows that 68.42% of survey respondents answered yes to being tested for HIV and are identified at a higher risk. I'll go ahead and pass it on. Thank you, Haley. Um, I will be talking about food security. So food security is defined as having at all times both physical and economic access to sufficient food to meet dietary needs for a productive and healthy lifestyle. Food insecurity exists when access is limited or uncertain. Our main findings in food security in Johnson County include 19% of total respondents cutting or skipping meals because there wasn't enough money for food, and the frequency of this event happening to an individual was 47% almost every month. 8% experienced not eating for a whole day or whole days because there wasn't enough money for food, and 47% of people experienced this, again, almost every month. 54% of our respondents experienced not eating, or I'm sorry, uh, experienced using food assistance programs like receiving food from a church, a food pantry, food bank, or eating in a soup kitchen. Additionally, we measured food insecurity by the following statement. The food that I bought just didn't last and I didn't have money to get more. Respondents had the option to choose between often true, sometimes true, or never true in the last 12 months. In Johnson County, 7% described the statement as often true, 13% as sometimes true, and 79% as never true. These results, results have slightly increased since the 2015 Community Status Assessment. In 2015, community members were asked the same statement and 2% described it as often, 8% as sometimes, and 82% as never. This statement means that the percent of Johnson County residents that often or sometimes didn't have sufficient food or funds to get more in 2015 increased in 2022. In addition, the statement, I couldn't afford to eat balanced meals in the last 12 months was often true for 9% of respondents, sometimes true for 18%, and never true for 73%. Likewise, the 2015 data showed an increase from 5% often, 11% sometimes, and 74% never, meaning that there are more people unable to eat balanced meals because they couldn't afford it since 2015. Overall, we noticed that there were disparities by race and ethnicity, income, and education levels in all areas measured by the assessment. Data is disaggregated even more in our report, which was referenced in the chat, but I'd like to highlight some. For cut skip meals by race and ethnicity, among respondents that identified as Black or African American and Hispanic or Latino, Latina, Latinx, they both had a higher percentage of experiencing cutting or skipping meals, 51% and 49% respectively, than uh, white identifying respondents, which was just 10%. For uh, whole days without food by education level, this graphic describes the percentage of respondents that experienced whole days without food uh, by education. As we can see, those with four years or more of college were less likely to experience days without food. Meanwhile, 30% of those with grade 12 education level or 25% of people that did not complete high school um, experienced whole days without food. Our next figure shows emergency food 
uh, utilization. So this figure shows that 84% of respondents with an income less than $30,000 utilized emergency food services like food pantries, food banks, or eating in a soup kitchen. Uh, and this percentage is lower um, when income is increasing. And in our next slide, we see food sustainability uh, by race and ethnicity. So based on the statement, uh, large disparities can be seen in the percentage of respondents that stated, sometimes true to the statement, the food that I bought just didn't last and I didn't have money to get more. Among Black or African Americans and or Hispanic or Latino, Latina, Latinx, they said sometimes true to food not lasting and not having enough money to buy more. Their percentages were 36% and 33%. Meanwhile, only 6% of white respondents had experienced this. And for our final slide, uh, when looking at the statement, I couldn't afford to eat balanced meals, disaggregated by sexual orientation and gender identity, our data shows that it was 32% often true and 13% sometimes true for LGBTQ plus respondents in Johnson County to experience uh, not affording a balanced meal. Using the behavioral risk factor surveillance system data, LGBTQ plus Iowans that could not afford to eat a balanced meal had a prevalence rate of 36.2%. And this is all for food security. We'll now transition into our Q&A section of our reports. So far, I don't see any questions in the Q&A, but um, I'm going to just go ahead and enable everyone um, to unmute themselves. If you have any questions, we're happy to answer any questions you might have. Um, but if you don't wanna unmute either, feel free to just throw it in the Q&A and then we can um, definitely get to that. Jamie, do you want me to go ahead and moderate the questions? Yeah, Sam, that'd be great. All right, we got one that uh, has just come in. Uh, have you looked at food insecurity by age? For example, are older adults at increased risk for food security? So we uh, did not disaggregate it by age, uh, but if you'd like, I'd be more than happy to um, do a data request and I can uh, get your report for uh, our assessment through all measures of food security uh, by age. Here's another one. What percentage of Johnson County residents are overweight and obese? Giselle, if you wanna take that one. Yeah, um, we don't have a specific percentages since our we had a small population fill out our survey, um, but of that response, we saw that more than half of our respondents were within that overweight to obese range. If folks don't have questions now, uh, as always, and I know that Jamie had added the link to the chat, the full report is online. Uh, and if you'd like to follow up uh, afterwards with other questions, please feel free to do so. Here's another one. Uh, given the lack of food access that was identified, is there a way to correlate that to zip code and then identify solutions geographically? I can answer that. Yeah, we could look at um, respondents who provided their zip code and who answered questions about food security. Um, that wasn't 
specifically put in our report, but we could definitely accommodate a data request for that. Yeah. I will add if there is a specific request, that email that's on the slide here is perfect to reach all of us. So all of us have access to that email and um, can definitely take a look at, at that request. And it really shouldn't take too much time for us to really get that to you. Um, so we're happy to really accommodate in any way. Perhaps you can talk about the about what implications these findings have for community work. I'm sure it's in the report, but just figured I would ask. I can take a quick uh, jump at this one and then feel free for anyone else on the team. Uh, no, I appreciate the question, absolutely. So uh, a part of the entire process and what some folks may have seen from the department in past iterations uh, is a very linear process where we're um, approaching um, data collection uh, in our community very quantitatively, um, either looking at primary data that we're collecting or other secondary data to eventually get to this point where we're identifying health priorities. In the past iteration of this process for Johnson County Public Health, we had 17 health priorities selected. Um, moving forward, we are hoping to look uh, towards uh, a model where we have roughly three to five priorities where we can um, look at working with either community partners, subcommittees to address those um, as best as possible. 17 was, was far too much to, to kind of break off and, and really um, channel efforts into, but we're hoping three to five, uh, which is also recommended by um, our national association uh, to really look at whether um, we can start with different communities and other community groups that we can either work with that are already doing this work or if there are other gaps uh, in our community to, to spearhead that. So um, stay tuned, hopefully uh, and well-intended um, for the rest of this spring and summer to finish out our assessment phase uh, to look at compiling a full report and information so that we can provide that to our community partners, our community members, uh, all in to uh, eventually look at prioritization uh, of what those will be this fall and early, we'll say early uh, to late fall, um, so that we can continue to look at what improvement planning looks like. So uh, our process, um, as best as possible, we're wanting to make very cyclical and less linear, where it's the first two years you do assessment, third year you're prioritizing, and four or five where you're doing improvement planning. We're wanting to make sure that this is very cyclical. Uh, one, because Johnson County has so much going on uh, in our community, but then also there's always uh, so many other efforts that we'd love to either support uh, or be a part of, though. I'm excited about this question, so I can just answer this this one. <laughs> so the question's, I'm curious as to whether um, access to health care may depend on transportation availability. So for example, whether the public transportation is available to the respondents area. Um, so we are in this next assessment looking into healthcare access and we are looking into mapping um, locations of clinics and other healthcare assets in our area. Um, using GIS, and then hopefully we're looking into overlaying um, bus stops, really. And so, you know, that's only going to give us one, one piece of information because bus uh, stops are really complicated and you also have to factor in um, the time that the bus schedule is going. You know, we can say we have a bus schedule to North Liberty, but it's only, you know, twice a day at a certain time. Um, so it's it's a little bit tricky, um, but we are looking at that, and we're we're kind of curious to see um, see how that will play out. But some clinics we have asked questions of, um, do you provide transportation assistance? So we have that that data too for some clinics in the area. But yeah, we'll be excited to share that information later when we when we have more of a comprehensive map available. I'm not seeing any more questions in the Q&A at the moment, uh, but if folks would like, again, uh, please feel free to reach out to us. The report is online. I know that um, Jimmy reposted the link as well. 
um, but we can hang out online for a little bit longer if folks are, are thinking and trying to type in what they're uh, wanting to ask. But I uh, appreciate everyone joining us today, and hopefully we'll see you uh, for part two as well.